Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Hello, I'm Mark Bowling, and today I'm interviewing Cardinal John Rebat from Papua New Guinea. It was in 2016 that Pope Francis announced that he would elevate John Rebat, the Archbishop of Port Moresby, to become Papua New Guinea's first Catholic Cardinal. His appointment is an example of the pontiff reaching out to include voices of the church far from Rome. Adding to his titles, Cardinal Sir John Rebat is also President of the Federation of Catholic Bishops Conference in Oceania, covering a vast area that stretches right across the Pacific Ocean and includes islands that are on the front line of climate change. Your Eminence, thank you very much for speaking to me today and welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. If I could ask you first of all about your own personal journey. As a shepherd of God, what, uh, how have you arrived at this point? I grew up on an island, and on, on this island, as, as I grew up, I saw uh, many, many challenges in, in life as I was a growing young person. To go to school was always taking us 45 minutes where to walk, and that was uh, during those days. Eh? And this island is really remote, and that's how I grew up, and, and you now my, my parents taught me how to, to really live a life of trying to grow in your education, in the primary school, also in, in the preparatory education and so on. So all that kind of counts into this. But also with that, it's really the formation of our faith. Eh? And it was very strong in, in that. So the priests usually come and, and visit us on the island. There are a number of missionaries. They are from Germany, from Austria, uh, at least these are the ones who are coming out to, to see us on an island. And so I was seeing them uh, coming to visit us, and all what I was seeing was that they had interest to be able to visit the sick, and also just be with the people, visit the families and, and, and everyone. So they would come, if they come out to the island, they would come for, say, four or five days. They are there with us, and then they go back. So it's really a great visit. And I was attracted to this land by the priests who were coming. And, you know, my parents were always, you know, my mother was always a very strong in, in the devotion of Mary and in their work because I was also, when I was in the seminary, I was also a member of the Legion of Mary. And in that way, I was formed also into this, uh, kind of having that uh, devotion to Our Lady in our life. And, and for that, that has really helped me to grow in this way. And then I was, I was seeing the, the priest uh, living, coming, visiting us and, and living their life. Their way of life was really kind of attractive to me. And for that, from the, and, and what was interesting, I can still recall when we were kind of growing up still, not yet in school, we're just in the village. Eh? As children, we were together and I would gather all my, my cousins and, and we were together there in the village. And I remember I would be acting as a priest kind of, uh, and we would have the coconut shell and so on to, pre to, to kind of pretend that this is really the, the ceremony that we were going through the mass and so on. So that's how I, I, I developed this interest and kind of grew with me. When I went to school, this remained with me. But of course, in the, now the, after high school, I have the choice to be a doctor and to be a priest and to be also, I was think to be kind of a, a lawyer. But then, what came out very strongly was priest. 
So a doctor, a priest, or a lawyer. You chose a priest. Yes. You also chose the missionaries of the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. As I was growing up and in the high school, what captivates me and what kind of uh, got me to, to really uh, attract me to the, the life of the priest also was the Franciscans. And uh, in the high school, you know, I would go to the, the library. The addressing was attra they attracted me the, the habits eh, as for the Franciscans. So I usually go and research this in the, in the library, encyclopedia and so on. So I was seeing that and, and then I said, okay, this time I like to be a priest, but a Franciscan. So that was my interest. And then uh, even when I, I finished from high school, I went to the minor seminary. A minor seminary, I continued this. And uh, there now the, the vocation director for the Franciscan came and I enrolled myself. I want to be a Franciscan. So that went on and until when I completed uh, grade 12, I, I continued to, to, to uh, meet with the, the vocation director, Father Colin Convey. He was a Franciscan from Australia. So I, I got myself enrolled. And then it was at the end of uh, grade 12, I said, I will come. But in the meantime, they, you see, they, they, there is a, a policy in the seminary in Rabaul, where I came from. There was a, a rule kind of from the beginning, from before yet, that all the local boys over Christmas they should take care of the seminary, cut grass, and make sure things are okay. And so, so that's what we were doing. And I was helping out Brother Clark, an MSc brother, because the St. Peter Sennel College was run by the missionaries of the Sacred Heart from Australia. They, they run the minor seminary there. So one afternoon, uh, after lunch, brother called me and said, John, Come with me, help me load the vehicle with the eggs, and we go down, we deliver the eggs to the places where we were selling our, the eggs from the, sem, the, from the minor seminary. We did. And then when we came back, he said, John, what are you doing next year? Now, now it's the end of the year. He said, oh, you know, I, I've enrolled my name, and I enrolled as to, to, to enter the, the Franciscan the order. And then he said, John, you think seriously about this? Because the Franciscans are not here in Rabaul where you come from. The MSCs are here, we are from here, and we work here. And so think seriously about that. And then I asked him, brother, you want me to become an MSC? But he said, for me, that's what I'm suggesting, but you make up your mind. I said, okay, I'll think about it. The next day, I came back, I was thinking seriously about it. I said, oh, yeah, that's true, what he, what he said. Brother, what, what brother said is true. We are not in the places where the Franciscans are, but here. So I said, I went back to him and said, yes, brother, I will be an MSC. So the time came, came to join, to go to the novitiate now. Oh, I, 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 I talked to him. He gave my name to the vocation director, and then that's where I began the journey as an MSc. After Chanel College, the minor seminary, I went to the novitiate. And then the journey began from there. So it is really what I was attracted to from the beginning came now the congregation that I want to follow. And that is the MSc, Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. It certainly does sound, listening to you, that you are a man amongst your own people. And that was deeply in your heart right from the beginning, that you wanted to be with your people and stay amongst them. And, and the opportunity came with the missionaries of the Sacred Heart to do that. Yes, that was it. And at the end, I, when I, I, I continued to think about it now, I said, yeah, thank you that I, I've, I've gone this way. Because Brother Clark was, the, it was, it was an old, old MSc, mm. and he, he was so strong so, and, and very firm also. So he just <laughs> mentioned that to me. And I think it was a turning point for me to really make up my mind, to really follow which, which order. Your Eminence, Papua New Guinea is a land of, of contrasts. In fact, they say, Papua New Guinea, expect the unexpected. It's a grassroots place. When you travel around, 
What encouragement do you give to your bishops? What do you see on the ground when you visit the highlands? Uh, Papua New Guinea is as uh, we have more than 800 languages, but maybe kind of decreasing now to less than that. But then as, as, as many as 800 languages, we have cultures as many as that. That itself kind of uh, see, kind of challenges us, how do we keep the, the people together united? Uh, so that's a challenge we have. And, and, and as the saying goes, expect the unexpected. And, and I think this is uh, really the, the, the way we live our life there. So sometimes things that uh, we may think differently about it, but coming together, it turns out to be very different. Uh, and, and people always come up with something that, uh, that speaks about trying to come together and so on. For example, in our, our celebrations and so on, uh, you know, people come up with all kinds of uh, uh, activities, uh, activities and events that tries to kind of encourage each other coming together. But of course, there's also those moments when we see that uh, people kind of uh, come out differently. And now your contribution, now as a Cardinal, mm -hmm. someone chosen by Pope Francis, Pope Francis, of course, who sees the, the social face of the church changing very much. Yes, yes. You're in a key position in Oceania. What, what's your, your vision for how this region should be? It should be the church, a church that is strong, a church that is truly the people, and a church that people will feel that this is the church where they belong. So, and, and that reminds me also of um, a number of uh, meetings we had the bishops came together, plus the people, and uh, we were working on a slogan, a kind of a program for the whole church in Papua New Guinea. Of course, the Solomon Islands, uh, Solomon Islands also, because we are in the same conference. Eh? And in those meetings, we were seeing, we were kind of working out what should be the kind of uh, the theme, the slogan for the church in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands. And then in one of those meetings, we came up with this theme that we are a church alive in Christ. And this is what we, want, uh, we, we wanted to promote. And that's exactly what uh, myself, I want this to be really the theme that must really be truly alive. People must feel this. They are the church and they should be the one kind of working on this. And therefore, also that's why uh, I took on the task of uh, uh, making people aware of what, what affects them. And especially those uh, in relation to issues like climate change and uh, other projects that try to come, seabed mining. Uh, that's what, uh, these are some of the things that I, I face. In order to make people aware that, yeah, these are the things that can have potentials in uh, challenging the church and the lives of the people, the livelihood of the people. What can be the church's role on the front line facing these sorts of issues, the development issues, the ecological challenges of sea rise and the rest of it? Well, uh, the, for us, it's really our, the, the position of the church or the work of the church is really to kind of make people aware and also the government eh, at that point, make people aware, the government, that uh, we are responsible for the church and also for our nation, for the, the good of our people. Challenges, for example, like seabed mining, a project that kind of uh, endangering the marine life and our environment also there. And so we were kind of bringing out things that, uh, that needs to be known to the people. And also the government was, were, were kind of not uh, addressing. Uh, so these are the issues that we make people aware. And of course, also with uh, the challenges of the, the climate change, the high rise sea level, this is also one area that we continue to kind of uh, make people aware of it. Because this, uh, this challenges us more in the whole Pacific, the, 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 the high-rise sea level, because we are all you know, affected by this. And we are seeing what the sea is doing to our islands. It's washing away good parts of the islands already, and it's getting smaller. And in Papua New Guinea, we have the first uh, island that has to be uh, evacuated. It's not because uh, of fight or whatever, no. But the issue is that they are losing their homes. Their, their island is being washed and disappearing. And that island, Cartwright Island in Bougainville, 
that uh, is, they are really facing this difficulty, has been broken into three parts. The island itself now is really disappearing. When I, la, the, last year, when I was in Spain, and there was this topic about climate change, and then we had to, they asked, uh, when I was saying, you know, one of our islands has to be evacuated already. So, they, what is the name? They want to Google it, and they did. Cartridge Island. And there we saw, broken into three parts. Now the other one is washing away. So, it, like that. So, so, and, and then when we saw that, I said, we cannot look for a better example. That's what it is. And that's why we had to talk out. We had to speak very loudly so that we may be heard. What can the church do? What can the leaders do to make an impact on climate change? What I'm saying that if you could be our voice to represent that in, in big meetings like this and really talk about our situation, this will be a big help to us because we have to really make known our situation to nations, for example, like a developed nations, eh, to hear us and, and really work on a way, how can they help us in a way, to be the voice and to really make this known to, to uh, developed nations. In those conferences, I think it will, be, it will really be a, a good message to them about what is happening to us. What has Pope Francis said to you about taking a lead role in getting this message across. He came up with a, 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 a message to the world, and that is uh, in Laudato Si. So and that kind of spelled out the, clearly the situations that will, will affect us. Eh? We are using his message, the message that came out from that, to be able to kind of base our approach about what, what is happening to us. And so he's encouraging us. And me, when I see that, I see that, yeah, he is really a kind of addressing our issues and someone needs to be able to come out and, and talk more about it and really relate it to our situation where, where we are. He did not address this, uh, his, his message only to the Catholic Church, no. It is to humanity because the planet that we are living on is, is, is belongs to all of us and we are in it. And it is really the whole of humanity should work together and to be able to uh, bring this message out clearly. And that's for me, that's where, when I saw that, I said, this is the point. His address to us to be able to do this, this is what we need to hear. This is what we need to, to, to uh, kind of uh, bring it out more to our people. Your Eminence, the daily challenges of being a priest, and especially anywhere in the world, but in Papua New Guinea, how do you deal with that? And how do you pass that knowledge on to your priests? The challenge is always there, every moment of life. But the thought to be faithful is always there also. So, and, and the thing is this, you have to make decision every moment of your life. And the connection here is this, to have that deep relationship with Christ, with our God. This life is not stopping you from, from doing normal things. Eh? I mean, what I, what, I, what I mean is this, to be able to work with people and, and relate to them in a way that helps you to be united with them, helps you to give them life. What kind of life? It's a life of Christ and, and, and a life that kind of unites, a life that uni unites us and work together and, and be truly the people that we, we, we want to share life with. Yeah? And in, in that positive way. One other thing, I, I also in my formation, that's what I saw. And this is what I, I believe, eh? that uh, this way of life is not to keep you away from people. They are there to be with the people. But see how you leave it so that uh, it, it, it does not kind of uh, uh, divide you or kind of distance you from, from the way you live with the people. And that's what I, I like myself because, you know, uh, living with the people and, and, and kind of uh, journeying with them, working with them, and, and all those challenges that we face. For me, I draw the strength from there. And then another question is, how do I live my life uh, in relation to my, you know, the formation, but also the sexuality that we, you know, that is truly part of us, it's within us, deep within us. How do you live that? 
And for me, this is how I see it. And my formation, that's how I, I was kind of thought, taught. Yeah? It's, it's really that, you know, the energy that you would have to be able to kind of uh, have for this life, you know, that energy helps you to go out with the strength. It's, it's not only for one person only or what, but that is for the whole community now. That strength you go out with to be able to share with all. And that you are open to receive all, and you are open to be able to share life with them. And, and that is, it's not one person, but it's the whole community. And for me, this, I draw, I drew strength from that. This message about energy and sexuality, is that something that you can easily talk to your priests about and that they can respond and understand? You know, the sexuality that we have, we did not choose it. It is a gift to all human beings, all person. This sexuality is given to us. We did not choose it, God gave it to us. But then how do we use it? In a way that helps us to live our way of life, for example, marriage life and, and this life here. Uh, how does it help us to live this joyfully and meaningfully in our life? So it's a challenge that each, each person has to realize it and, and really live it. So for me, the way I see it when I live my, as I live my life, it is meaningful that I, I share it with the people as well. But of course, the thought of kind of having a wife in life, it will always be there. And, and, and a challenge that I have to face until I die. And a challenge that I have to kind of uh, face in relation to living my life. And it is a challenge that I have to face. And I talk to, to a priest about it and so on. And those information, I do talk about them. Eh? And even to, to to uh, seminarians also. I'm, I'm working with our seminarians and so on. That's what I talk to them about. You know, it's a challenge that people have to make decisions about. So at the end, I have to make also decisions all the time about where, 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 where I am with my life in relation to the God-given gifts of sexuality in my life. Because if we see, uh, the way I see it, it is this way. And if I've kind of helped seminarians and so on to be able to see this, I think it's, it's, it's really a kind of a message that uh, they see, they accept. But of course, I, I understand, I realize that uh, it's not always easy, but with God's help. And because it, it came from Him, and if this is given gift to us, and if it is Him helping us, I believe we'll find strength to continue to live this until the end. Your Eminence, Cardinal Sir John Rebat, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. Yes. Good. Thank you. Darwin World Television is coming to Australia. This is a great gift. It's been gifted to many parts of the world and now it's our Australian turn to receive it with open arms. I welcome it, I bless it. It's going to really support family life, married life, youth. Give us a resource that uh, we know that uh, we need really help in the, it's great help in these areas. May Almighty God bless this new resource coming to our land in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.